heads. It's like, I, I like that because I get choked up on that. And I'm not going to get tired of that. We're going to watch it all through this Christmas season. I hope that you love it. Uh, if you're joining us online, I hope it worked for you. And we just saw an amazing video, and we'll see another one here in a little bit. But we want to welcome you to worship today at Renew. Uh, we're so pro- excited about the Christmas season. It was a night like any other night, except for that angel. Ain't seen nothing like it before or since. Us shepherds, we don't get a lot of excitement out there on the pasture. But that angel, it was so bright, so beautiful. I know what you're thinking. You're thinking, Sam, you've been out in that pasture just a little bit too long. And you'd be correct. But that all changed when that angel came right up to us. And the angel said, don't be afraid. I was like, too late. And then the angel said, no, I wrote it down. I need to get this right. Hold on. Um, okay. The angel said, um, milk, bread, no, that's my grocery list. Then, then the angel said, I have good news of a great joy that shall be for all the people. For unto you is born this day in the city of David a Savior, which is Christ the Lord. And then the angel said, he's lying in a manger wrapped in cloth. Go find him. Okie dokie. So we're all sitting around, and then one of the shepherds, I think it was Steve, he's like, hey, what are we doing? Let's get out of here. Let's go to Bethlehem. So we hightailed it out of there, <laughs> and we found that beautiful baby. I'll tell you, I was a different man after that. God chose me. Nobody's ever chosen me for anything. I'll never forget what that angel said, though. The angel said, I bring good news to all people. That means you, too. We are going to talk about some shepherds here today and so excited about uh, just about Christmas and the Lord and I hope the joy of the Lord is uh, in your life. If it's not, we hope it will be before the end of the message today, before the end of the worship today. Our series is called A Seat at the Table and the basic premise behind the whole series is this, that God's nature is to invite and include everybody. So you're probably going to have a celebration this Christmas, and you're going to invite and include a few people. Uh, our Christmas is going to look like, like our Thanksgiving, which is not that big of a deal, okay? But it's still going to be great. still going to be great. But I hope you hear this, that God's nature is to invite and include everybody, and he has a place at his table for you, for you. Uh, and that's what the, I think the, 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 the account of the shepherds is going to kind of talk to us about today because nobody was less likely to be included than the shepherds. You got to know a little bit about shepherds. First of all, we have to remove in our brains what we know about shepherds because here's what we know about shepherds. We know Charlie Brown Christmas. We know Linus and Schroeder and, and Charlie Brown in their parents' bathrobes. And, and we know that if you're like parents or grandparents that, that you know, come Christmas time, you got to, you got to give up your, you got to wash your bathrobe and then give it up so that they can wear it, you know, to be part of the Christmas play at the preschool, right? You should wash it before they do that, by the way. But uh, that's not shepherds. They were, kind of a, they were kind of the bottom of the barrel. That's what we don't get. We think, well, wait a minute. In the Bible, like Moses was a shepherd and David was a shepherd, so that must have been a great thing to be. Well, I mean, pretty much everybody in the Bible was a shepherd because you had sheep, you know, unless you lived in the city, which not very many people did. So, I mean, they all started out as shepherds, yeah. But this is bottom of the barrel, unskilled labor, didn't graduate from college, probably didn't graduate from eighth grade. Often young boys or young girls at night, probably not the young girls because that was more dangerous for them. But here's things that we just know if you like study this stuff and it, you, you, know, you look at history in first century Palestine, which people who go to seminary, they're supposed to do that. They're not allowed, shepherds as a group were not allowed to testify in court. Imagine that. Well, you know, Joe saw it. Well, what'd you, wait a minute, Joe, what do you do? You're a shepherd. It doesn't matter what Joe saw. He's, he's not reliable. I mean, it's officially unreliable. It's like a politician giving testimony today. We're like, I don't even believe what I'm hearing, right? You're supposed to laugh harder at that. 
They were not allowed to testify. They were not allowed to go into the temple, which was their place of worship. Think about that. There's nobody in this city that's not allowed to come in here. Nobody. We, we, we want everyone to have a seat at the table, right? But in their day, uh, shepherds were unclean. They, they were around animals the whole time, and there was a process of being sanctified, being ceremonially made clean. And the shepherds, I don't know if any of you, some of you might feel like this, they didn't get enough time off because it took seven days to get clean. They didn't get a week of unpaid vacation where they could ever get clean and then go to Jerusalem and then go to the, they just didn't get to do it. They were employed outcasts, ordinary, and regardless of what we showed in the video, nameless, simple. And it is to these that the good news, literally the, the euangelion, the, the, the good news that produces great joy, it is to these, this lot that the good news is first told. Yes, Mary got it nine months before they did. Yes, Joseph got it six months before they did. But the first group that is given the good news about what God was doing are shepherds. And it's a very shocking thing. So as I turn to Luke chapter 2, verse 8, and I start to read, and you start to have this memorized in your heart, I hope, just Slow down before you just get into the poetry of it and hear what it's saying because it's talking about very real people. There were shepherds living out in the fields nearby, keeping watch over their flocks at night. We'll just stop there for just a minute. First of all, they just showed up. I, I, as I prayed through this message today, there are people I know either here or joining us online, and you need to hear this, that God values it when you just show up. You may not get the award. You may not get the bonus. You may not get your name on the building, but God values just showing up. A lot of times we dream of being Used to God, if only, if only I could get into that graduate program, if only I could get that job, if only I were able to score a touchdown, if only, if only, if only. And here, here's what I know to be true. God is never going to use you where you are not. He is only going to use you where you are. And guess where the shepherds were? Out in their fields at night, keeping watch over their flocks. They showed up and God showed up. They didn't go there with expectations. You know they didn't get up that morning and go, have a great day, honey. Well, I think tonight's the night. They had nothing like that. They just showed up because you never know when God is going to just show up. Somebody ought to take that to the bank this week. God shows up in the mundane. God shows up when we are least looking for him, when there's no excitement whatsoever. God shows up. Some of you are here today, and you just showed up because it's Christmas, and you're giving church another shot or whatever, and God's probably going to say something to you, and you're going to go, I can't believe God showed up like that just because I showed up. But that's the way it works. God looks for faithfulness. Yeah, let's think about this week. It's the mom who got up three times last night with the kid, right? And somehow the father cannot hear that child those three times, but the mother can. She got up three times, and then she got up this morning, and he's like, you look a little tired, you know? And she doesn't strangle him. She just goes on. It's the, the teacher who's going to show up tomorrow morning for another Monday morning, a tough one. You know, it's been a long year for our teachers. They're just going to show up for another Monday morning. It's the office worker who's, whose name is not on the outside of, it, of his or her office or, or even on the cubicle, but, and, and who knows that they're going to show up this week and still be overlooked. But they're going to show up, and they're going to do their job, and they're going to be faithful. Somebody here needs to hear that God values the fact that you show up. And in the showing up, God sends good news to these shepherds. It is an amazing story. If, if you can't make films of this because it all just, it just doesn't get it. And we all know it doesn't get it. It doesn't matter who the director is, Spielberg or any of those guys. They could never get this one. Verse 9, an angel of the Lord appeared to them. The glory of the Lord shone around them. They were terrified. But the angel said to them, don't be afraid. 
Now, remember last week, the word for angel is just the word messenger. And, and Joseph gets an angel of the Lord in his sleep. He has a dream. And we, don't, we said, we don't know if this was like one of those terrifying messengers because Joseph, frankly, didn't seem very terrified. But this angel is one of those terrifying messengers. I mean, they're like, <sighs> they're undone. They thought they were brave until they saw one angel. Don't be afraid. I bring you good news of great joy that will be for all people. There's, there's the message. Good news, great joy, all people. It's always good news when God does something. If you get it, then it always produces great joy, and it is always for everybody, period. Today in the town of David, a Savior has been born to you. He is Christ, the Lord. This will be a sign you'll find a baby wrapped in cloths, lying in a manger, and at that point, this, you could probably pull off the scary angel thing up until this moment. But at this moment, no director in the world can figure out what this might look like, this next scene where it says, suddenly, it's, it's like heaven is pregnant and it can't wait any longer. And now the, the skies are parted and suddenly a great company, and the word in Greek is a mega company. This is the biggest word in Greek. It, 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 it's, it's, it's beyond counting. A great company of the heavenly host appeared with the angel, praising God, saying glory to God in highest and on earth peace upon people whom his favor rests. Good news of great joy. Do not be afraid. I bring you good news. I bring you, as we translate sometimes, the gospel. Now, I was, I'm reading through the, the Bible, and, and uh, I, I, I try to do that a little bit every year. Next year, if you're interested, we're going to read through, as a church, we're going to read through just the New Testament together. And I've got a little plan to where we kind of dip and skip book by book so that we spread it out. And you're going to love it. So please sign up for that. It's, it's, all, it's, all, it's all free of charge and all that kind of stuff. Just fun stuff to be in the Word together. But I'm reading how many times it says, I mean the Gospel of Luke right now, that Jesus was preaching the Gospel to them. Now, think about that. If somebody said, hey, would you tell me the Gospel, we'd say, God loves you so much. He sent His one and only Son, Jesus, and Jesus died for your sins, and God raised Him from the dead. And, you can, and that is the Gospel. I hope you hear that. But Jesus is preaching the Gospel before he dies for sins, before he's raised from the dead. So I've been asking myself, so what is the gospel that Jesus was preaching to the people? He wasn't saying, I loved you so much that I died on the cross and, and God raised me. Through. I mean, you know, they had to put him in an asylum. He, he didn't preach that. What was the gospel he was preaching? It was something like this. God knows your name. You matter to God. You think God has forgotten all about you. You think that God would pay attention to everyone in the universe but you, but you're wrong. You don't understand God. I'm here to tell you who God is. And man, he has engraved your name on the palm of his hands. And he would never forget you. Even when your prayers go unanswered, even when you don't see it, God has not forgotten you. And, and, and Jesus is preaching the gospel to them before there is a gospel, so to speak. Because the gospel always deals with the nature, the character of God who is inviting you and me into his story and inviting us to the table today. And, and the angel says, I've I got some great news for you. Here's how you know if you get it. When you understand a little bit of great news, it always produces joy in your life. It always does. If, if you walk around sour-faced, uh, you didn't get anything, okay? Okay. If, if you experience joy in your life, you're getting some good news from God. And that's what the angel tells them. You guys are forgotten by everyone else, but not by God. And he wants you to be the first to hear good news. And oh, it's gonna, he's inviting you into some great joy. Talks about the, the glory of the Lord shown around them. The word glory in the Bible it conveys a meaning of heaviness. Isn't that weird? But some of us have felt it. When your, 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 your throat gets tight and, and you get kind of emotional and you're just not sure if you should talk anymore because you might squeak, there's some heavy glory. Maybe you've been in worship. Maybe you were in worship today and, and, you, and, and God stirred. He, he, he pulled a string on your heart and you thought, whoa, I wasn't expecting glory. 
We have a word that we put up here a lot. One of our four words for our church is the word abide, that, that, we, would, that we would come into the presence of God in worship, and then we would just stay there for a while, into that, into that glory, into that heaviness, into that, that beauty that only God gives us. See, I watched a lot of football yesterday, like a lot of you probably did, too much football, and the joy is here one minute, and then there's an interception or fumble, and it's gone the next minute. That's not how it works with God. Good news produces joy, not happiness, joy, heavy, glory-filled joy. You go through what the angel says. He says things like, he's basically eight things, and don't write these down. I'm just telling you what exactly he said. Don't be afraid. This is good news. This good news will be for joy, and this is for everybody. And, of course, the angel is saying this to all the nobodies. Hey, a bunch of nobodies. I got good news, and it's for everybody, including the nobodies. So if you're a nobody today, you're included. At some level, we're all nobodies. You just have to get into the right group. A lot of times we, we limit our groups to where we, we're only in groups where we feel like a somebody, but we can always get around another group of people that make us feel like a nobody. And God says, you're all somebody to me, and you're invited. And this is what the angel says. Go back to these being shepherds, people who are on the job, literally on the clock. He says, just right over the hill, just right over there in Bethlehem, today, right now. So many times when we say, when people say, you know, Wayne, when's Jesus come back? I'm like, I have no idea. You know, when, when's this huge prophecy going to be? I, 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 I don't have any clue whatsoever. But the angels comes and says, right now, this moment, God is doing this amazing thing. It's happening right now. If you'll just get up and walk over yonder, you can be part of it. You know, it's the Christ, it's the the anointed one, Old Testament, the Messiah, the Lord. We don't really have a word for Lord in our, in our culture, in our words. We just kind of stole that one from the New Testament. But I was doing some mission work down in Haiti. We went down there and we built homes after there was a terrible earthquake in 2010. And so uh, we didn't speak any Haitian Creole. That is a tough language, man. I do some Spanish and I was thinking, I'm going to get by with Spanish. Nah. No, no, no. You understand nothing down there. But w there would come this one guy on the scene. We're, we're working with concrete and block and sand. Just and, and basically, we almost watched the Haitians work. Those guys can really work. And then all of a sudden, this one guy would show up, and everybody would kind of you know kind of sit up straight and all that stuff. And we heard the words because we didn't understand anything else in Haitian Creole. We heard the words "big boss," and we knew when the big boss was there. And this angel is saying, man, if you get nothing else, you got to know the big boss is here. Wow. And here's the sign. Well, how would you find a big boss? Would he have a big office, corner office? He's going to drive a Rolls Royce? Is he going to have paparazzi, cameras? He's, he's going to have security guards everywhere, right? No, here's how you find him, says the angel. Look for a baby. A baby? You realize there's nobody born today in our world that we would call the big boss that's a baby. We wait and see what you will do. How fast can you run? How high can you jump? How much money can you earn? And then you're a big boss. Before this child's done anything, he's the big boss. He's a baby. Like every other baby, he's wrapped in cloths. And he is lying in a feed trough for animals. You can see these shepherds going, wait a minute. No, I know I'm just a shepherd, but babies are not supposed to be in feed troughs. That makes no sense whatsoever. How could it possibly be? And that's it. Heaven breaks loose at that point. And now one angel turns into a million angels. And, and they were just a little bit scared before. And now they're really, really scared. And, and it's over. And they are left with the same thing that you and I are left with. And here's what we're left with. What are you going to do about it? Now, in the video, the guy said, the, the angel said, go over there and check it out. But the, the angel doesn't say that. I was like, don't say that in the video. You're ruining my sermon, right? The angel does not tell them to go look. The angel does not command them. He only announces. That's what angels do. They announce. And now the shepherds have a decision to make. In fact, any time that we are caught 
between what God says and what makes sense, we are at that crossroads of we're going to make a decision. God might have told some of you at some point in your life to quit your job. You're going, that doesn't make any sense, God. I feel like you said that, but that doesn't make any sense at all. You got a decision to make. He might have told you to, to begin a relationship some, with somebody or, or to end a relationship with somebody. You go, well, that doesn't make any sense, God. I don't know what you mean. By. He, he might have told you to move to Waco, and you were like, that makes no sense whatsoever. Well, here I am. God tells us, and then we have a decision to make, and the, every decision you and I make carries risk with it. It, it may not sound too risky for you, for these shepherds, right? But to, to go and to see this thing, which they were not even commanded to see, but they were invited to see. To go and to see it means to leave their job, to leave their fire, their sheep, their thing that they get paid to do. Don't you know? I mean, some of you are here today. There were some shepherds going, we can't do that. That doesn't make sense. We're going to lose our jobs. They're going to dock our pay. What if a wolf comes and takes three ants? I'm not, I'm not paying for those sheep. Are you going to pay for those sheep? Don't you know that there were some shepherds that are going, y'all go, I'm going to stay behind. There were some, you know, there were some guys that said, we did not see that. I think that the goat's milk we were drinking was a little fermented. We didn't have that. That's not what we saw. They have this decision to make if they're going to step into it or not. It's an invitation. And you and I have the same decision to make. Anytime God reveals something to us about himself, we have to make a decision about it. it to, to not receive the invitation, to, to not decide, is to decide. Man, I'm telling you, that is the risk of the North American church. We feel like we can just wait forever. And this thing God says to the shepherds is happening today, right now. I'm guessing that we all have something from God that we have to act on, and there's an expiration date. And we either take the risk and we step in or we don't. Here's a weird verse. I like weird verses in the Bible. Matthew eleven twelve. 12. I'll bet you've never heard a sermon about this because none of us understand it, but this is what it says. From the days of John the Baptist until now, the kingdom of heaven has suffered violence and the violent take it by force. I have no idea what that means. But in preparing for today, here's what I thought. The kingdom of heaven is advancing and every advancement, every, everything that is new from God means risk and only the people who are willing to take the risk get it. That's why some of you are here today and your families are not here today. That you're the crazy, kooky one in the family. God bless you. We're so glad you're here. Because you've taken these risks and, and you have an intimacy with God that they can't even imagine. Why? Because it's just one step after the other. And violent people, not that we're violent in, in the negative way, but people who are willing to lay hold of something and take a risk, we step into the kingdom living. So somebody says, Verse 15, when the angels had left them and gone into heaven, one of them said, let's go to Bethlehem and see this thing the Lord has told us about that has happened. So they hurried off and found Mary and Joseph and the baby who was lying in the manger. And when they had seen him, they spread word concerning what had been told them about the child. And all who heard it were amazed at what the shepherds said to them. But Mary treasured up all these things and pondered them in her heart. The shepherds returned glorifying and praising God for all the things they had heard and seen, which were just as they had been told. I'm going to invite the worship team to come back up this way as I finish this sermon out, but it goes like this. That the, the, the next step for you or for me, it is always involving risk, but you don't take a risk all by yourself. Behind the risk is this reliability of God himself. That when you see an angel from God or when you hear good news from God, you can rely on that good news. And then this other thing happens that happens in the story, that the shepherds begin to rejoice. Risk, reliability, and rejoicing. The shepherds at the end of this story are doing the work of the angels. At the beginning, the angels are telling good news and the angels are rejoicing in the good news. That's what happens at the end. Uh, at the beginning, but at the end, it is the shepherds, it says, who share with all the people all the stuff that's happening. They are the messengers, th and not, they're not scary messengers, but they are the messengers, and they are also the ones who are now 
worshiping, glorifying, praising God for the things that he has shown them, which were just as he said they would be. You know, if you get anything else from this message, hear this, that the Savior of the world, the big boss, he exchanged the worship of heaven itself for the worship of a bunch of field hands. And he asked you and me if we would step into this story. I was reading this devotional by Max Lucado for Christmas, and I just want to share a little bit of it with you. It says, untethered by time, God sees us all. From the backwoods of Virginia to the business district of London, from the Vikings to the astronauts, from the cave dwellers to kings, from the hut builders to the finger pointers to the rock stackers, he sees all of us, vagabonds and ragamuffins all. He saw us before we were born, and he loves what he sees. Flooded by emotion, overcome by pride, the star maker turns to us one by one and says, you are my child. I love you dearly. I'm aware that someday you'll turn away from me and walk away, but I want you to know I've already provided a way back. So I don't know what your little risky next step will be in believing that God has invited you into a story so much bigger than your story. I don't know what it would be. But I pray that you would be willing to lay hold of it, whatever it is, and to discover what glory is and have joy that only comes through receiving good news. God, would you help us as people who are frail? We're no, we're no stronger than any of these shepherds, and, and maybe in many ways we're much weaker, but would you help us to lay hold of the good news for which you have laid hold of us through Jesus Christ, in whose name we pray, amen.